Welcome everyone. I'm Will Fenton, Director of Research and Public Programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. This is the second installment in a three installment seminar on uh, John Dickinson and the making of the US Constitution. Uh, and you'll notice if this is your very first session that you're attending, this is a little bit different than our traditional seminars. First of all, it's on Zoom. But I think fortunately for you, your camera isn't on. So you can sort of relax. We're all having a week right now. And so you don't have to feel the pressure to, um, to look as alert as you might otherwise if you were in our reading room. Uh, that being said, I encourage you to participate. Uh, and there are a couple of ways you can do that. First off, there is a chat feed, but I will confess that if you put a lot of questions in the chat feed, I'm probably gonna have a hard time keeping up with it. I am not so good at multitasking. Um, but really the preferred area for you to participate, you'll see two overlapping dialogue bubbles at the bottom of your screen under Q&A. That's a great place to log your question. And if you happen to go in there and you see someone else's question that you think is really poignant or incisive, or you really want us to get it, to get, you know, sort of find time for it, feel free to upvote those particular questions. So you can just sort of like basically push it up. And I will probably start with those questions that have the most sort of uh, shared um, appeal because, you know, I just drawing from our experience with the first one, we got a lot of good questions. And I wanna make sure that we're able to get to the ones that are um, of the widest possible appeal. Um, so we are gonna set aside time, probably 20 to 25 minutes at the end of this session. Um, uh, at which point I'll come back in and I will read your questions for you uh, to our esteemed guests. But until then, let me pass this over to your venerable seminar leader, Janie Calvert. Well, thank you, Will. And uh, thanks again for organizing this and for asking me to do it and for the library company and the staff for hosting. You all have been really terrific in keeping this running smoothly. Um, so, um, I'll just give a little bit of background information and uh, uh, some things that I gave in the first session um, in case uh, people weren't here. Um, so when um, Will contacted me about doing the seminar, he initially asked me to do one on the Constitution. And I'm not an expert on the Constitution per se, I'm an expert on John Dickinson. So I suggested that we make it about John Dickinson and the three major um, uh, moments where he contributed to the creation of the Constitution. So um, the last session was uh, with uh, on um, the Articles of Confederation, and uh, my guest was Liz Covart. Uh, next time, we'll, we will be doing um, ratification, and my guest will be John Kaminsky. And this time, we're doing the Constitutional Convention, and my guest is Jack Rako. And uh, I wanted guests on this because, as I said, as I'm an expert on Dickinson, but not necessarily on these various moments in the constitutional history. So um, Jack Rakove, of course, is um, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian um, uh, on the Constitution. Uh, his book, Original Meanings, won the Pulitzer Prize, and, and he's written um, numerous books on the Constitution and uh, especially on James Madison. So I thought he would be really perfect to come in and uh, help with some of the specifics about the Constitution and the Convention. Um, so, um, and, and you'll have to excuse me, I, I, uh, I don't have um, all my resources at home that I do at my office. So I've got my computer down here with my notes that I'm, I'm looking at from time to time. So um, I wanted to say just a little bit uh, about what it means to be an expert on John Dickinson. So he was one of the most active and prolific founders from the very beginning of the controversy with Britain in the early 1760s, all the way through the ratification of the Constitution and Bill of Rights and into the early Republic. But um, we don't know as much about Dickinson as we do about the other leading founders because he's the only major figure whose papers have not been uh, collected and published so all, when you see all of the uh, founder, founding father biographies and uh, monographs, they are all drawing on the published writings of these men. Dickinson doesn't have that, although there have been several attempts. Uh, and so I decided to found the John Dickinson Writings Project. 
and we published volume one, we are about to publish volume two. So that only takes us up to 1763. So the, the years of the convention are quite beyond that. So even though I may know more about Dickinson than most people, I still am learning about him and I learn new material about him every day. And it's quite possible that I won't be able to fully answer your questions or respond fully to Jack with his, uh, his, his points, just because I'm still learning what Dickinson was thinking. Uh, so then the purpose of the seminar is to show people what is available in Dickinson's writings and his correspondence and how rich these materials are. And they'll provide us with a, a, a treasure trove of new information on the founding and this very important, really uh, instrumental thinker in the founding era. Um, so uh, Chris, uh, sorry, um, uh, Will has already told us a little bit about the structure. Um, you'll, you'll have some comments from me in uh, at the beginning and then Jack and I will have a conversation about Dickinson at the convention and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So uh, I gave an introduction to a little sort of mini biography of Dickinson's life at the last time. I'm not gonna do that full thing again. Uh, I, will, I will say just briefly, uh, he was born in uh, November 13th, uh, 1732 in Maryland to a Quaker family. And uh, he, they, the family then moved to Delaware, which was at the time the three lower counties of Pennsylvania, uh, kind of its own colony. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then at the age of 18, he traveled to London to study law at uh, the Inns of Court, the Middle Temple in London. And this was the legal heart of the British Empire at the time. And very few Americans actually had the opportunity to, to travel there for their, their legal education. Um, so when, as soon as he returned to Pennsylvania in 1757, he opened, uh, he, he started his law practice and, uh, and quickly made a name for himself and then started serving first in the Delaware uh, uh, Assembly and then in the Pennsylvania Assembly. And it's important to note that Pennsylvania at this time was a Quaker colony. It was dominated by Quakers politically, economically, culturally. And Dickinson's family was also Quaker. And so he really uh, grew up and functioned in this Quaker environment. And as he aged, especially during this period, we see that he adheres more closely in, uh, to Quaker values and uh, Quaker priorities about how the country should be and um, how he should be spending his time. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead right now to some immediate context uh, about Dickinson at the convention, and then I'll go back and give a little bit more background uh, on about some of his um, uh, suggestions that he made in the convention. So um, Dickinson had always been very strongly inclined towards uh, philanthropy or charity. And so when he was uh, in the Pennsylvania Assembly, for example, he routinely asked that his, uh, his salary as a legislator would be donated to needy families in, in Pennsylvania or in Delaware. And uh, he became um, much more uh, engrossed in philanthropy as he got older and uh, giving money for, uh, for all kinds of philanthropic purposes. In 1785, he was just finishing up his final term as president of Pennsylvania. He previously been president of Delaware. And so in 1785, he retired in that capacity. And in 1786 and 1787, as he was thinking about uh, revising the Articles of Confederation. He was the president of the Annapolis Convention that met to discuss revising the Articles of Confederation, which if you, if you saw our previous session, he wrote the first draft of the Articles of Confederation and put in a lot of his kind of Quakerly priorities uh, 
into that draft, all of which were excised and none of, none of them made it into the final version, but in any case, he tried to put them in there. So by 1786, he was no longer president of Pennsylvania and he was really, he felt a very strong um, calling to turn to philanthropy and help those the, the least fortunate in society. And this was a priority for Quakers. The purpose of, of government, as far as Quakers were concerned, was to um, uh, provide for the widows and orphans. So in other words, the most vulnerable of society, the government was there to provide for them. So he was taking this, this duty upon himself. And in 86, 87, as he was thinking about reforming the Articles of Confederation and having a constitutional convention, he was um, engaging in abolitionism. So he'd already, he freed in 1786, he, he finally freed all of his slaves unconditionally. And it was a good number of slaves, it was at least around 50. And so abolitionism was a key, uh, a key concern of his, uh, the uh, reforming prisons. Uh, so he gave a good amount of money to uh, the prison, the first prison reform society that was established in America. And he continued to care about uh, the poor. And so his main interest in the poor was education. And he founded a number of schools in Delaware and Pennsylvania, specifically for the education of the poor and education of black children. So the one that remains most prominently is uh, Westtown Friends School, which he was instrumental in founding. And um, he, 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 he gave not just um, uh, funds, but also uh, land, building materials, and he interested himself in the curriculum. And he was very concerned to establish a liberal arts curriculum in these schools uh, where they could learn. Um, his two priorities were science and religion. And these things for him were not, um, they did not cancel each other out. Science was a way to understand uh, religion as far as he was concerned. So, um, so he, he wanted also that, that students would be educated in things like languages, other humanities, as well as trades. So this is what was on his mind when he came to the Constitutional Convention. And so getting to our topic of this evening, Dickinson took his seat on May 29th, uh, shortly after the convention had begun. And uh, he stayed through September 14th, the day before the convention ended, but um, he was distracted by ill health. He suffered from debilitating headaches and other ailments that um, caused him to not be able to function at his, at his peak. And he also had other business. He had his law, his law firm to worry about, or his, his legal practice and uh, his business dealings. So periodically he returned to Wilmington for his business purposes. So for example, um, uh, we know in uh, June, of, uh, June 27th, he went back to Wilmington. Mid-July, he was also back in Wilmington. So when we see kind of you know, gaps in the record, it could be potentially because he was actually physically not present or he was ill. Um, so um, as we look at Dickinson's role in the convention, um, I'd like to focus on four topics and we can, um, you know, I think the conversation is just going to flow between Jack and me and, uh, and we'll, we'll see where we go. But uh, the main things that I identified from the readings that I put together are the following. So um, the question of representation, and uh, that's a complicated one and uh, it'll take up probably the bulk of our time, although I hope not all of our time because there are other things I'd like to talk about as well. Um, then, so the, so the number one is the rep representation. Uh, number two is um, the executive power and electoral college, which I think will be especially interesting today. And uh, I'd also like to talk about the question of slavery which I assume will come up probably in other, uh, other capacities as well. And uh, finally, I think it might be interesting to say a word about religion at the convention. Um, but um, so as we get into the first big issue of representation, before we 
get into this, this is where I'd like to give a little bit of um, historical background on Dickinson's career, because I think it would be useful. So um, Dickinson had been thinking about this issue of representation for 20, 30 years before he got to the convention. He started thinking about it really immediately as soon as he got back to Pennsylvania from his training in London. One of the types of cases he took as a lawyer were um, flag of truce cases. Now these, these were um, uh, basically cases about whether Americans had um, the right to trade with France during the French and Indian War. The King and Parliament were suggesting that the colonists did not have the right to trade with the enemy. But Dickinson was looking at the British Constitution and he said, actually, the colonists did have this right, as long as they weren't trading in warlike provisions, uh, munitions, uh, and stores. So, so he took these cases to court uh, where uh, the, it was usually a, a Dickinson representing a shipping company or a ship, ship's captain against uh, um, the, the, either the king or the uh, specifically um, uh, another sea captain or another, another shipping company. And Dickinson said specifically that the crown or parliament, they do not have the right to prohibit this trade that the colonies were engaging in. And what we have here is sort of the very first, um, well, maybe not the very first, but one of the early um, tensions between the colonies and the British Empire where Dickinson was keeping in mind this, um, um, this, this concern that we, that constitutional scholars have called gubernaculum versus jurisdictio. So that's the power of the government versus um, uh, sort of the line that can be drawn between the government and uh, the government's right to exercise that power. So basically the jurisdiction of the government. And Dickinson said the, the, the king and the parliament were ever stepping their bounds when they said that the colonies could not trade um, with the enemy as long as they weren't trading in warlike stores. So he very early started thinking of the problem that became the focus of the controversy with Britain in the American Revolution, which is how do you solve the problem of um, uh, imperio in imperium or a state within a state? And, uh, and so you have the larger, you know, the British government and then within the British government, you have all of these colonial governments and in, 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 the, in the discrete colonies and, and where should the authority lie? And Dickinson was uh, one of the foremost thinkers in trying to understand where the line should be drawn and where the power should lie. And so in his uh, letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania in 1767-68, he shifted the debate away from overtaxation, away from the type or location to the nature and purpose of the taxation. So his argument presumed, presumed that there would be two legislative bodies, each with its own jurisdiction, where the people should be represented. And, and he was saying that, you know, there's a difference between what the British government can, can, can regulate and what the colonies had a say in. And the issue was, of course, that the Americans were only represented in their colonies and not in the British government. Um, to, for those of you who are interested in reading further on this, I'd recommend um, uh, the book by Alison LaCroix, um, which is called Ideolo Ideological Origins of American Federalism. And she treats Dickinson in this uh, more extensively than most, uh, most authors. So, so he had been thinking about this for a long time. And, and also as he, he thought about this issue, he brought to bear his experience with, um, the, with his, his Quakerism, his family's Quakerism. So the Quaker meeting was actually structured very much like um, like a federal system. There was an overarching yearly meeting. And within that, there were um, subordinate meetings, uh, quarterly meetings um, and monthly meetings that were organized by geography and the calendar. And these bodies sent representatives um, from, they were more or less sort of democratic, small d democratic bodies, and they sent representatives. And so there was this, this, um, this kind of a federal system that he had sort of built into his understanding of the world. 
So he brought, he brought these things to bear um, when the issue came up in the convention of representation. And so as he entered the convention, the, the delegates were trying to, they knew they had to solve this problem. And so um, the, the first thing to be presented at, at the time was the Virginia plan. And this is where I think we, Jack and I get into uh, a discussion of what was actually going on and what Dickinson brought to bear on the discussion over the question of representation. Um, so um, where are we? We are May 29th, uh, 1787. And uh, Dickinson had just taken his seat. And we have the question before us of um, the Virginia plan. Jack, would you like to jump in here? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's important for, you know, your listeners to know that um, uh, a bit of a bit of caucusing had gone on in Philadelphia prior to when the convention actually mustered a quorum. The convention was supposed to meet uh, on May 14th. Uh, the Pennsylvanians, because they lived there, were there. Uh, Dickinson was in the neighborhood, but not, I think, present. Madison, being Madison, showed up uh, uh, early uh, to kind of take the lay of the land. And the Virginia, uh, the Virginians mustered a quorum of their delegation as well. Washington arrived punctually as well. And you never want to disappoint Washington. He was rather irked, to put it mildly, that uh, the other delegates were somewhat dilatory uh, in showing up. So, you know, the Virginians and Pennsylvanians sit down together and they, they, and they, they, they try to block out an agenda of action. Uh, the Virginia plan itself, I think, was probably prepared more or less concurrently with this. Madison had been working on things going back to his, well, actually, going back to, you know, the fall, winter of 1786, back at uh, his, uh, the family plantation at Montpelier, outside Orange, Virginia. But the plan itself, I think, was drafted literally uh, within a fortnight or so before, before the convention finally mustered a quorum. One big debate was whether or not you would try to deprive uh, within the rules of the convention, whether you try to deprive the, the states of the equal vote that they claimed um, first out of the Continental Congress and then in the Articles of Confederation, uh, going back to 1774, the Pennsylvania said, let's, let's say that we should have some proportional rule of voting uh, within the convention ab initio from the very beginning. Madison says, no, I mean, that would alarm the small states too much. We should do that. Uh, we should do that as, as we go along. So I think, you know, what, you know, from, Look at how the convention, you know, organized its business. So the Virginia, you know, the first thing it did once it adopted rules and elected Washington to be the presiding officer <clears throat> was Edmund Randolph, as the governor of Virginia, read his his state's plan, and everybody took copies of it, and then they adjourned and they started to think about it, and then they came back and then they came back the next day or two and they started a, they started figuring out how would we actually implement this agenda. Some some delegates felt that uh, the Virginia plan needed some kind of prior introduction as to what were the true purposes uh, of true purposes of the convention. I think what's interesting about this is, as, as I read it, uh, is that um, Dickinson and George Reed, another Delaware delegate, um, thinking immediately about the question of would the states somehow retain an equal state vote under you know under either revised Articles of Confederation or should the Articles of Confederation be supplanted by some other plan, which is, of course, what the Virginia plan anticipated. So Dickinson and Reed more or less conspired to have the Del Delaware legislature draft a you know, formal instruction to them, saying, you know, to, telling them to adhere to the principle of an equal state vote. And they read this at, you know, at the outset of these early discussions. And the other delegates said more or less, well, that's interesting, but you know, so what? You know, we're not, you know, we're, we're not, you know, we're not going to be bound with this. I thought it was interesting. I mean, Dickinson, who, you know, had a lot of prior experience going back to Kyle Congress, his involvement in Pennsylvania politics, uh, you know, his, the time he spent back in England in the mid-1750s being educated. I mean, Dickinson knew what he's doing. I mean, he's a shrewd guy, a shrewd guy, a political operator. I think in some ways a bit of a loner. I mean, Jane has more pronounced opinions on this than I do, but, you know, with that kind of Quaker sense of conscience. You know, kind of, kind of went his own way. So I, I think Dickinson and Reed were trying to give themselves an advantage that, in the end, didn't work. I mean, Madison's position when, when uh, the Virginians and the, and the Pennsylvanians were figuring out their strategy just before the convention mustered its quorum was, 
you know, uh, you know let's, let's not alarm the other states at the beginning, let's wear them down by the force of argument or political reason as we go along. So I, I think Dickinson and Reed were trying to preempt that in a sense, uh, with, you know, with this business of getting an instruction for the legislature, but the other delegates weren't about to accept it. Uh, and so from that point on, then the convention gets involved in these open-ended discussions, trying to lay down first principles. You know, when we think about the executive, you know, uh, big debate on June the 1st, they at least agreed the executive should be vested in a single person, although Dickinson would reject that in principle. Uh, they agreed the executive should have a negative, meaning a veto on, you know, at least on, you know, on, 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 on the acts of the legislature. Um, you know, but so there, you know, so I, I think there's a certainly attempt to, to kind of flesh out the agenda. You know, Dickinson, the active part of this, I mean, Dickinson was really the first one to say, I mean, really looking pretty shrewdly and acutely down the road that um, in the end, he thought by way of compromise or conciliation or whatever, that, you know, somehow, the, somehow some vestige of the states having an equal state vote was going to be retained. I mean, it wasn't, we usually call that the Connecticut Compromise. I don't think Connecticut was all that important. I mean, it's a nice place to visit and so on, but I don't think it played the, I don't think it played a critical role in making this happen. Dick, I think Dickinson was the first one to firmly articulate this as kind of the, you know, kind of a fundamental position for the small state delegates. Right, right. So, um, so right. I think Jack is right that um, George Reed, who was um, uh, also an attorney and a close friend of Dickinson's from years ago, were very concerned with keeping, um, they were concerned about the welfare of the small states. And uh, they were afraid that the small states could be overtaken by the large states. And so they wanted at all costs, uh, or at least most costs to re retain what existed under, under the Articles of Confederation, which was an equal vote for the states. Um, but Dickinson was aware that that was not the only issue they had. I and mean, I think Dickinson's overarching concern, and, and this is funny because if, you, if, you, if you've read uh, the, the, the very limited scholarship on Dickinson, you, you find people saying like, oh, he was a nationalist. Oh, no, no, he was a states rights guy. Well, actually he was both. And, and he was very concerned that the central government, and I'm not, I'm, I'm saying central in particular because there wasn't, federal is a, a complicated word. Um, the central government was too weak. They needed a stronger central government. Um, they needed something that was going to um, preserve the states as such, but also have a stronger central government that would keep the states from just going their own way and doing their own thing. So Dickinson, with this history that he had of thinking about the relationship between the British government and the colonies, because it was the same problem that the Americans were trying to deal with. It was the same imperio, in imperio, in imperium problem that the Americans were dealing with in the revolution that they were dealing with now um, under with the Articles of Confederation failing and trying to establish a new constitution. Um, so, 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 so Dickinson was sitting here thinking about this and, and I, I, I agree with Jack that Connecticut, I mean, Connecticut came around, basically came around to what Dickinson had proposed. Very early on, Dickinson proposed that there should be equal representation in one branch and, and um, uh, the, so the state should be represented in one branch and that should probably be equal. And then the, the people should be rec represented in another branch and that should probably be proportional. Um, and so he, he proposed this early on and it kind of just, fell flat and nobody picked it up. And it took weeks for the convention to work back around to what we now call the Connecticut Compromise, where Roger Sherman and the others were basically building on what Dickinson had proposed very early in the convention. So, um, so I think, but, but of course, I mean, this was not, this was not the Virginia plan, and it was not the the uh, New Jersey plan. That's why you know we're we're calling it the the compromise because the Virginia plan was coming in and saying like you know we want proportional representation and and which Dickinson thought could jeopardize the small states, 
And then the New Jersey plan, which, uh, which was going to be more or less just warmed over Articles of Confederation and, and Dickinson didn't want that. So, so he put forth this, this compromise um, that, that sort of melded both. And not that it's entirely unproblematic, but probably it's what allowed the convention to move forward. Do you think that's true, Jack? Not necessarily, no. I don't, I mean, let's, let's take a step back. I mean, I, you know, this issue, this issue was, was never gonna come up. Doesn't matter who talked about it first. Uh, I think the key fact is that, the uh, key fact for people to know is that Dickinson and Roger Sherman, going back to 1774, 75, 1776, uh, Dickinson's not in the first Congress. It kind of shows up as an observer fairly late in the proceedings. He has this kind of funny relationship. He's, he's added very late, if I remember correctly. Well, well, so yes, he was he was added late. Added but, late, yeah. But he still wrote. He, I mean, his presence loomed right. large right. over the convention. I mean, I'm oh, sorry, over the, the Congress. Time. And even though he he showed up late, he wrote. He he right. he 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 created the drafts of the documents, right. and so yeah, he was out of date. But it was both Dick, Dickinson and Sherman were both involved seventy five seventy six when discussions about the Confederation uh, come come to be very serious. I mean, the Connecticut delegates had prepared their own draft of Confederation seventeen seventy five. Um, it was never actively discussed, but it was kind of circulated, eventually printed in the Connecticut Court. I mean, this issue was there all along. And the question is, you know, uh, and, and Dickinson and Sherman were both equally versed. You know, it's important to know that one of the principal reasons why it took so long to get the Articles of Confederation out to the states was that precisely the disagreement over representation was, you know, it's one of the, one of the three issues that Congress couldn't reach agreement on until after the Battle of Saratoga, they just say, we, had, we, did, we need a confederation because we wanted to have an alliance with France. We don't have a confederation. They're less likely to, you know. I mean, this guess is all my first book, which was, came out only 40 years ago. And I half, half remember what I said in it, uh, <laughs> you know, half, uh, half the time. Um, but so, you know, there are, there are fundamental questions that come out of that debate that we're wrestling with still today uh, as to whether or not, you know, on what basis should states have an equal vote do we why do we care you know i mean yeah on what basis do we you know you know do, do we have the senate yeah you know it's uh, it's, 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 a, it's a trick question i used to tell my students okay jake can i do this little story i say you go, you go to a mixture you go to a dance and there's some other person you want to meet what's the best opening line you can use of course nobody knows what i'm going to say so i say you go up to that person either sex it doesn't matter so what's the only clause of the constitution not subject to Article Five Amendment, so it's kind of a true trivia question. The only clause of the Constitution not subject to Article Five Amendment is the is, it says no state can be deprived of its equal vote in the Senate without its own consent. Meaning, even you can't even if you had two thirds of both houses of Congress and three quarters of the states, you still couldn't amend the Constitution to, to get rid of the Senate. I personally think that's a terrible mistake. That the equal state vote is an awful idea. It's going to become more and more of a problem in American politics in the years going ahead. People have been doing the calculations. By, 20, by, by 2040, uh, you know, 30% of the population will elect 70% of the Senate. But l let me just stop you there really quickly. So, I mean, you said it was a mistake, but um, I mean, if we situate ourselves in the time period and look at it from Dickinson's perspective, he's representing this he, he, he was one of the few people at the convention who had a foot in both one of the largest states and one of the smallest states. He, he really, his career was divided equally between these two states. But now he was, uh, he was returning to his roots and he was now you know, a Delawarean. And he was very concerned that the small states would get sort of you know, co-opted, somehow taken over by the large states. And you know, I, I've, been, I've been thinking, a fair bit about this recently and, and trying to th like trying to get into his head and think what was he thinking about and so you know Delaware was a, a kind of a strange animal it was part of Pennsylvania it was technically the three lower counties of Pennsylvania but in 1705 they essentially broke off from Pennsylvania now they shared 
the same governor only because the Penn family owned both tracts of land, but, um, but they had their separate legislature and a separate judici judicial system. And they separated from Pennsylvania because they, they, I mean, I think because they really just didn't, they weren't kind of like on board with all of the Quaker stuff that Pennsylvania was doing. They were, they were less ardently Quaker, really not Quaker at all. Right. So they did their own thing. Um, then when they became a state in 1776 and Dickinson was, um, you know, he was leading the charge in that state for abolitionism. He had just written abolition legislation, which didn't pass. And he was hoping that he could put that legislation forward at another time when it would pass. Now he's, he's there in this like tiny little state that sort of, you know, erstwhile appendage of Pennsylvania, but right there to the West is Virginia. And Virginia is huge, it's very powerful. And even though Pennsylvania is going towards abolitionism, Virginia certainly is not. And so I think he was worried about small states like Delaware just becoming sort of subsumed by larger state concerns and, and subjected to them. So he was worried about whether the, the trade would, would uh, the, the larger states could co-opt the trade of the smaller states. He was also worried, I think specifically, and this is in the, um, um, in the readings, uh, he was worried specifically about this, the slavery question and whether or not the, the states would, would be allowed to determine the extent of the slave trade. He didn't want that to be the case. He wanted the federal, the, the central government to, to, to abolish the slave trade because he, he thought states were too, inter, too, too interested. And so I think he was probably worried that Delaware could be sort of swallowed up by, by a large state like Virginia with its slave interests as, as he was trying to abolish slavery in Delaware. And um, right, Jane, I mean, you're saying there is a specific link between the equal state vote and Dickinson's specific concerns about emancipation. Do I say abolitionism or just emancipationism? But, no, abolitionism. And, and actually it's in, let's see okay. what document. So, but even so, are, are, are you saying that his concern for equal state vote is driven by his anti-slavery feelings? I'm wondering about that. And well, I'd be really skeptical because well, I, wait, I mean, let, the conventional wisdom. Yes, he said. In um, the late 18th century, is that slavery is an internal institution of the states. So, so said, long as the state had its authorities over internal police. I'm looking at my what, notes. What happens in Virginia wouldn't matter. Really quickly. Um, oh, I thought I jotted it down. Um, uh, this is what happens when I can't have my physical documents open in front of me. But he said in one of the documents that um, is in the reader, he said specifically that he was worried about the slave states overtaking the smaller states. Uh, so, you know, what I- it, What does it mean to overtake? Well, right, so- um, like, I don't he, understand, I'll play dumb, I don't understand this. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I do either, but but what I'm gleaning what I'm gleaning from from the documents here is that Dickinson was concerned about um, the trade, about about trade being taken over, and he was concerned about the possibility of you know the large states kind of um, uh, basically taxing the smaller states, and I don't know I don't know if we can say that means like a direct tax like them them exerting a tax directly on the small states or through the national legislature. But, you know, he pointed to Athens as, as an example of well, something. See, that's a look, I have, you know, I hate to say it, but Dick, I don't find Dickinson very convincing on this. I mean, as you know, I'm a well-known Madisonian in these debates. Right. I would, you know, I, 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 would, I would tend to, I, would, I think Madison in the end is a much more sophisticated thinker than Dickinson is. I mean, Dickinson was clearly worried and the, the, the document you provided in the pamphlet that the fragments on the Confederation or whatever that kind of pre-convention tracked. I mean, Dickinson was really worried that somehow that the small states uh, would become the, the economic victims of domination by the larger states. I think there are two big problems with that. One is the larger states as such do not constitute a coherent body of interest. This is a very Madisonian position, by the way. They have very different economies. They have very different societies. They have very different histories. The fact that they're large is irrelevant 
to their politics. So that's yeah. I mean, you you ne you never get together on the basis of being a large state. Oh, we're you know we're the large states. I mean, you could. I mean, you you might you know you know maybe in some kind of horse trade mode of politicking, if if you can command a majority of votes, you just you do you do a lot of pork barrel politics. But I don't think that's what anybody in the 1780s was anticipating. Secondly, when it comes to financing, uh, you know, taking taking care you know taking care of public finance, everyone I think. Uh, well, no, everyone expected Hamilton <laughs> in the long run to take charge of this. And D, everybody understood that the you know that you know that 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 the best way to uh, raise public revenue, especially for the national government, would not be to rely on direct taxation, which would involve something like a poll tax on slaves. Um, but you know, and that and that became part of the so-called Connecticut Compromise. Uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the, excuse me, that became part of the Three Fifths Clause. Yeah. You, know, you portion representation and direct ta taxation. Direct taxation being a form of taxation where the bill comes directly to you. It could be a poll tax, it could be a land tax, something similar. Nobody expected direct taxation to take place. Everybody understood, and this is Hamilton's wisdom, that the most productive form of taxation is simply to put you know duties or imposts on foreign imports. Uh, then the you know then you know then the consumer voluntarily and happily pays the tax because he's purchasing some object some object he or she wants. So I think the idea you know so I th you know so in that sense I think Dick, I understand Dickinson's concerns and that that little proviso we had in, in the doc you know, document to have a uh, you know a I forget the, the title but but have a have a kind of a taxation court to look at you know to look at inequitable forms of taxation. It's an interesting proposal. It had nothing at all to do with what anybody seriously was thinking about. So Dickinson has this really ingenious idea, which I found in the end was kind of irrelevant uh, you know, to, to what they were actually considering. But I think the larger point I want to make here, and I, want, and I really want your listeners to consider, is that we think about large states and small states as if they actually represent something, you know, some some driving principle of political activity. They don't. Nobody ever votes on the basis of the size of the state in which he or she lives, unless- No, but I think they do vote unless, on state interests. Unless you're voting on rules of voting, which is exactly the situation in 1787. Because then, then you have a prior commitment, you're trying to, you know, a prior advantage, you're trying to protect, you're trying to, trying to defend. But if you imagine the situation going forward and say, what will the large states do in the, in the future? They don't have a collective basis of action. And the same thing's true for small states. The fact, you know, the fact you live in a larger small state, you know, it's essentially irrelevant to political activity. So Dickinson is hung up on it. Maybe he's just being defensive for Delaware's interests. Maybe he really had a, a kind of strong commitment to the corporate identity of small states, which he, he somehow felt you just had to defend. If they didn't have the equal state vote, somehow their collective identity would be undermined or sapped. I wrote about this a lot in my book on the Constitution because I, I felt the small state delegates kind of move back and forth from one argument to the next as convenience you know, it's going to be just just fine. Man, but but they had Madison, Rufus King, and Hamilton, three, three pretty powerful minds. Had you know had, had the better arguments on this. Well, well, uh, maybe they had better arguments, but they still lost. <laughs> well, uh, well, actually, well, actually, the vote was. I mean, the interesting thing about the vote is, if if you go to the Connecticut Compromise, number one, it was not a compromise. The vote on the Connecticut Compromise, they call it a compromise retrospectively. The actual vote was five states to four with one state, Massachusetts, which of course was regarded as a large state, divided, I think mostly because Elbridge, Elbridge Gary was this kind of quirky personality, a real man, a true maverick, probably the first true maverick in, 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 in American politics. So it wasn't a compromise, it was a defeat uh, for the large state. The other thing that made it possible was that Gary and Caleb Strong, the other Massachusetts delegate, split the Massachusetts delegation uh, in half. And so Massachusetts lost its vote, so it became a five to four to one vote. So, I mean, I think, I think what Dickinson is thinking about here is, I mean, not so much the large states combining against a small state, although maybe, but, but, but more um, just lar uh, uh, maybe even a single large state kind of trying to absorb a small state. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question and I, I don't have the answers. I don't, I, I'm just, I'm really sort of feeling my way through this, um, not really for the first time, but, but maybe, maybe really in depth for the first time. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in, 
you know, why Dickinson was, was so committed to this small state, sort of the preservation of the small states, and why he was so afraid of the larger states. And, you know, and I don't know, I, I kind of equate it with, you know, the small sort of, I guess, like, nationalism, like the nation, the, na the idea of the nation state in the modern sense was relatively new. I and mean, we were just sort of, you know, we're, we're at a point where we start to see the, um, the, the creation of modern nation states after the American and French revolutions. And I think Dickinson is anticipating that. And, you know, we have, so, so if you say like, well, is, if small states don't matter, then, you know, what about like, you know, what about Finland and Switzerland and Luxembourg and, and, and you know, but I, that's not to say that Dickinson. Well, but those are two different kinds of states. Well, well yes and no. I mean, yes and no. And that's what I'm saying. Of the federal Union or states of small, you know, just small nation states. Right. I mean, I, I'm not equating the two exactly, but, uh, but in a sense, there is, there is a, a similarity between, uh, between the two. And, and so not that um, the American states were sovereign. I don't think that Dickinson believed that uh, that that the states were sovereign in in the fullest sense of the term. Right. There was sort of a partial sovereignty, right. and he was he was interested in maintaining some of that, but 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 not in the sort of not in the mode of this sort of uh, I guess you would say like you know the states' rights argument of the antebellum period. I mean, he was very concerned with having the central government be able to step in and maybe send in federal, you know, federal troops or, um, or, 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 or enforce taxation. So he was, he was not someone who was saying the states need to be preserved above everything else or that the state's rights to do this or that, you know, um, would prevail over everything else. But, but he was concerned with preserving the autonomy of the state, at least in not in regards to the necessarily the federal government or the central government, but in regards to neighboring large states. And I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's interesting. And, and, and so, so for better or for worse, he gave us the analogy that people in the convention adopted and we've used since then, which is the, the analogy of the solar system. You know, that was his, that, uh, that was his analogy that the, 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 the central government is going to be a sun and the states are going to revolve around it in orbit like the planets. And, you know, that's a very useful shorthand that, you know, we can still, we can still use today. Um, well, to, it, it is if you like analogies, I mean, but most, you know, I think as a story, most analogies break down and you, again, this is a Madisonian position, by the way, and you have to describe things on their own terms. I mean, when Madison thinks about federalism, what he basically says, you see this in Federalist 39, is that federalism, particularly as the Americans have designed it, is a truly messy system. It is, is what Madison, Madison, Madison says, it's a nondescript. Nondescript here doesn't mean, what when we say nondescript, we mean kind of blah. You know, nondescript means no one's described it. The only way to understand how the American federal system works is to kind of look at it in its details. If you read Federalist 39, which is a brilliant, but rather it's prosaic in one sense and brilliant in others. Madison explains, here are the multiple dimensions of American federalism. So yeah, I think the concern with sovereignty that you mentioned, I mean, it, it, it is an interesting concern. I, I think, you know, when I think about it, I think the Americans basically destroyed the concept of sovereignty. And this actually, this goes back to the imperial debates, Jane, that you, that you were talking about earlier. I mean, the debates with parliament in effect, or attempt to, you know, the, the British claim, what really comes out of the big debates over representation in the 1760s, is the British argue, to, British can see the Americans actually have some pretty good arguments about representation. You know, the question of whether or not any American colony could be fairly represented in, a, in, in, a, in the House of Commons, an ocean away, was, was a strong argument, particularly in the 18th century when the House of Commons is made up of members from rotten boroughs, uh, you know, like Wyoming today is kind of a rotten borough in, in the Mountain West. Idaho is really a rotten borough that the Republicans set up in the late 19th century when they worry about losing the Senate. You know, you know rotten boroughs or pocket boroughs uh, and so on. So the Americans have these convincing arguments about representation. The British response is to say, okay, let's, let's put representation on one side. In the end, we know that within the whole British Empire, 
um, you know, sovereignty is by its nature unitary, absolute, ir irreconcilable, ultimate, and so on. It can only reside in one place. That's the whole point of imperium and imperio for your non-Latin speakers. A state within a state. You have to fill out the phrase. It's 18th century, 19th century, you say, imperium and imperium is either A, a solecism in politics, meaning kind of a contradiction in terms, uh, or B, sometimes put it, imperium and imperio is a monster in politics. Those are the two, that's, that's, the full, that's the full phrase that, you know, that you're referring to. The Americans basically destroy that concept. Sovereignty is something that belonged to government. And it, there had to be some final, unitary, absolute, ultimate source of it. The whole American federal system essentially is a revolt against that concept of sovereignty. James Wilson, you know, uh, Dickinson's law pupil, try, tr you know, tries to rescue the doctrine. He says, well, here, sovereignty resides in the people. You know, the people decide from time to time how they want to allocate the powers of government uh, to both the national government and the states. And over time, you know, that allocation may well shift. So I, you know, I think Dickinson's right. I mean, you're certainly, you're certainly right to worry about the autonomy of the states. I think autonomy is actually a much better term. Sovereign, you know, yeah. sovereignty, I think you get involved in all these complicated yeah. theoretical discussions. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go back to Jean Baudin, you have to go back to Thomas Hobbes, you have to right. read William Blackstone in the end. Following Madison, they're not very helpful because the American system has basically evacuated, basically avoided uh, that concept. So Wilson comes up with a theoretical solution. The idea, the idea of states being autonomous is fine, but that goes back to your slavery question. I mean, you know, I mean, slavery was a man. I mean, there, there, there was no, there was no. I doubt there's any port in 18th century Delaware that it was even involved in the slave trade. If you wanted to buy a slave, you know, I suppose you go to Balmer. Some people call it Baltimore, but my college roommate from Salisbury, Maryland, said it's actually properly pronounced Balmer, uh, or maybe Annapolis. Go right. to a slave market there, whatever. Philadelphia. Uh, well, not Philadelphia anymore. Yeah, you know, yeah, not Philadelphia, but you know, but I mean, but slavery as a domestic institution would remain as it did remain subject. I mean, slavery, slavery was still present in Delaware in 1861, right? I mean, Delaware is one of the. I think Delaware is one of the states that has to be kind of persuaded. Yeah, better implement the 13th Amendment. You know. Right, I think they didn't ratify that until like 1901 or something like yeah. that. Maryland, Maryland did even later. You know. Right, so um, so let's, um, we're, we're, I, I figured we'd spend a lot of time on this. So let, let's shift gears. Um, is, you mentioned um, uh, something that, now I'm losing what you just said, but like, let's segue into um, Quickly to talk about um, the uh, the executive power and electoral college, and you know the, the electoral college, of course, is foremost on our minds at the moment. And uh, <laughs> I wonder why, right? Um, we're not frazzled at all. Um, so, so you know, it, 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 before I really started digging into this, I uh, heard um, you know people talking on you know, uh, the radio or whatever pundits talking about the origins of the Electoral College. And as it turns out, Dickinson was uh, a member of the Committee on Postponed Parts right. that dealt with how to elect the president. And what, uh, what I thought is very interesting is that uh, Dickinson, as far as the executive was concerned, he was very suspicious of executive power. Um, he said right away that you know, monarchy is not suitable for America, even a limited monarchy, we need a republic. And so he was uh, pretty, pretty well convinced from the beginning that uh, the, the executive should be popularly elected. And so he was on the committee that created the Electoral College. Um, but what I understand from the readings that I uh, gave in the reader, that he was quite unhappy about the Electoral College and still even after it was set a settled matter, it, it was a compromise uh, that, uh, that he, he wasn't happy about. And he still thought that the president should have contact with the people and should be popularly elected. Which also a position chaired by James Wilson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I guess in a way, I feel like I need to say that just to sort of clear it up and, and, and clear Dickinson's name of being complicit. <laughs> In, in in establishing the electoral college and said no he wanted a popular he wanted a popular election of the presidency um so um the two other things that i wanted to talk about this this evening were the slavery issue which we've touched well, on wait, already. Wait, wait, do you want to say more about the electoral thing well no, yeah if you do go ahead yeah well let me, yeah, yeah this is something i've written about extensively 
over the course of my career. And I, I write about it periodically. So as I'm here, I will put up a book just sitting next to me by my good friend, Alex Kazar, which is Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? Which is a comprehensive history of, uh, we're, we've been friends for half a century, uh, comprehensive history of, of the many efforts to get rid of it. Um, it's, you know, I, I think listeners ought to know, particularly at this moment, a couple of things are worth knowing. One is that um, the reason we have the Electoral College is not because of its own inherent appeal. Nobody's really sure how it was going to work. The framers defaulted most of the critical decisions about how the electors would be appointed to the states. Uh, they didn't. They did not have a coherent understanding of their own that they worked out. It's part of the convention looped through the whole question of presidential election several times, several occasions. Um, it was pretty much really the last serious item of business. They were still discussing it the week of September 4th to 8th. Um, in, you know, so more or less a week, you know, a week, a week before the convention finally adjourned on, 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 September, on September 17th. The real reason we have it is the two other modes of election, which be election either by Congress or by the people, uh, had killer objections against them. And the Electoral College became attractive in a sense, I think by default, not because, not because it was the most attractive, but because it was the least problematic. Uh, Wilson was the one who saw the advantage of popular election most clearly at the outset. Popular election, had, popular election had, 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 so position Dickens in support, I think was best articulated by James Wilson. Uh, but the position, you know, the problem with popular election was there are really two problems. One is there's a, there's a big sectional problem. Madison made this point, but then he abandoned it. If you have a popular election, there's only one constituency. Why do we call it the United States of America? States cease to be relevant, right? You have a single constituency, and all all you know all voting citizens will have the right to cast a ballot. The problem with that is you have a strong sectional imbalance because so much of the population in the South consists of enslaved African-Americans who have no political identity, much less activity, whatever. So that's the first problem. Second problem is it's basically an information problem. That it, it was hard to imagine, you know, at least in 1787, how would you identify a kind of finite group of, they would use the term national characters, you know, characters of merit. So I think the fear here was you'd have a lot of favorite son voting. I suppose now we'd say favorite person voting, but favorite son works pretty well for them. To have a lot of favorite son voting, it'd be very hard to get an effective decision uh, out, of a pop, out of a popular election process. There, I mean, there, there, there are other problems that arise with the congressional election that I'll, you know, that I'll pass over. Um, that's my phone in the background, sorry for the interruption. Um, so the electoral college, I think, is, it was kind of a default option. The curious thing that happens is as soon as you get to 1796, which is the first contested election, it doesn't matter if George Washington wants to be president, it doesn't matter what rules you use. You always get the same result, right? You know, if Washington wants to be the candidate, you know, you get the same result. 1796, when you had the first contested election, almost immediately two things happened. One is you had two outstanding candidates. A popular election would have been effective because you knew who the two main contenders were. And secondly, the electors themselves, who we think of as these kind of dignified citizens who are gonna use their independent judgment, uh, wind up in effect being tools of their political parties. The, you know, the first time you have a contested election, the presidential electors really show no independence. They were all tied. Well, they, they do show some independence because of Alexander Hamilton, because Hamilton despises John Adams and he keeps, he keeps coming up with schemes to have someone other than Adams, usually a pinky of one kind or another from South Carolina. So Hamilton comes up with these different schemes. Um, but that's because until you have the 12th Amendment, each elector cast two votes. He did not distinguish president from vice president. And you had to cast one vote for, um, a, for, for a delegate, uh, excuse me, for a candidate, you know, not from your own state. So the institution has this whole peculiar history. So, so I think Dickinson's support for popular election is interesting on the one hand. The idea that he liked a plural executive, along with uh, you know, George Mason and Edmund Randolph, were two other advocates. There was a, you know, to quote Borat, who's back in the news, there was a niche-niche proposition. The idea of having a plural, plural executive, I think. Well, well now, I mean, just remember that he had been, you know, the-, the, the oh, president, been president of Pennsylvania. Of states. Yeah, right, right. 
So he had experience with this and he, he had personal experience with how little power he had. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, so um, let's talk, you know, the, the issue of religion, we can all actually bump that pretty easily to the next session because um, when we talk about Dickinson's Fabius letters, they're, they're very heavy on religion. So um, I don't mind bumping that to the next session, but let's talk just a little bit about the slavery issue. Um, so um, um, I think it's remarkable that um, uh, you know, Dickinson was one of the few abolitionist members of the convention, and uh, so he had uh, he had started freeing his slaves in 1777. He freed them first conditionally, and then he freed them. Um, he had two other manumission deeds: once in 1781, and then in 1786, freeing them unconditionally. He provided reparations uh, for his former slaves. Um, and so um, he, his, his big contribution, there to, he made two contributions to the, uh, to the convention where slavery is concerned. Um, first was that uh, he was concerned that the states would be, the states who were importing slaves would be too self-interested to, um, to abolish the slave trade themselves. So he thought that it should be abolished at the, at the, the central or federal level. And so he made the motion that became Article One, Section Nine of the of the Constitution, abolishing the slave trade in 1808. I think he would have preferred to abolish it sooner, but that was that was yet another compromise that that he was willing to make. So it was 1808, actually the year he died. Um, and uh, in this, as you'll see in the readings, he actually wanted the word slavery in the Constitution as an acknowledgement of what America was doing. And he thought it would be an embarrassment to us if we avoided using the term slavery. And he would, he said, you know, it, it will be a sign that we're embarrassed about what we're doing, that we can't even say the word. Mm -hmm. um, so he wanted it kind of, in that case, he wanted it put in there sort of front and center. On the other hand, um, he was, on the committee uh, for uh, creating the Fugitive Slave Clause. And in this case, he wanted the language um, adjusted so that slavery would not be discussed in the, would not be mentioned in the constitution as a, an actual legal, a legally accepted condition. So um, he was probably the person who objected to the language which was proposed by Madison and Wilson stating that no person legally held in service uh, or labor who escaped into a, a territory, um, he wanted that term legally to be changed um, to under the laws right. thereof, right. which is, you know, really, you know, that's a very like nice lawyerly distinction, but, you know, Dickinson was, was, you know, he was using his legal training there to, to limit slavery in the constitution in, you know, what has rightly been called a covenant with <laughs> a covenant with death. Right. Um, and, but in this case, you know, we see uh, the rare occasion when a delegate is actually trying to limit slavery in the constitution. So, so I think that is, um, you know, is quite, quite remarkable. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I don't know, I guess we always think that, well, we wish that our, these historical actors had um, said more or done more, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 maybe it's better than nothing. Um, I don't know. Uh, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, do you have thoughts? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think I, I think the way you framed it is, is very nice. I, I wrote a bit about it in my book, Original Meanings. I did comment, you know, briefly on the alteration of language in the Fugitive Slave Clause to say, you know, to say to say on the one hand that uh, well, I mean, to, to note the difference between saying lawfully held versus you know meaning you know which implies a kind of moral, I suppose in a sense, a kind of moral endorsement of the institution itself versus a mere description saying that such persons exist and are, will be subject to restraint, but without the addition, without, I mean, lawfully their head can have a robust meaning, right? As, as opposed to a merely descriptive one. And that, you know, I, 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 I hadn't, uh, to be honest, I, I hadn't known that Dickinson on the other end, you know, kind of a nice, uh, kind of complicated complementary position that Dickinson also wanted to have the word itself directly inserted. I mean, I see that, you know, having had a bit of a Quaker education myself, 
being a hammer for grad, yeah. uh, though, though not a Quaker by practice, but having attended Quaker meetings. I mean, I see that in effect as a kind of, you know, inner light, uh, you know, kind of move. I mean, a kind of, a kind of sense of, you know, moral conscientiousness and more, or, well, more than conscientiousness and responsibility. Well, that, right. And, and he yeah. said this actually explicitly in um, one, of, uh, one of his uh, manumission deeds, you know, his daughter said, you know, he, at first he tried to make slavery easy, easier for the slaves. Right, right. But then he realized that that was never going to be good enough. And that if he was being honest, he would need to actually free them. And, and this was a matter of conscience. It was a matter of their, not just his conscience, but the well-being of the human beings right, right, under right. his charge. And it's also interesting to note um, over the years, slaves approached him and asked asked him to purchase them to get them out of bad situations so he would you know purchase them and then free them mm -hmm. and so this and then you know providing reparations for slaves who'd been who'd been freed who he freed you know decades before and he was still you know giving them you know uh things to help them live and so you know this was something that he was um you know really he felt deeply and yeah. um, and you know he brought this with with him to the convention and so and I, I, I think the deeper point to make here that your listeners ought to appreciate is that anti-slavery in the late 18th century let's say the period after sometime after about 1750 1760 really had two dimensions the easier dimension was the abolition of the slave trade and I think it's easier to sense because it's a it was it's, it was more dramatic to envisage um, how horrible slavery was. If you think of, that it, that its its initiating act is really involves kidnapping, you know, captivity, kidnapping, the middle passage, with all the horrors appertaining there too. Um, so it's, it was relatively easy to be. Well, I don't mean this. I don't mean to oversimplify, but um, uh, opposition to the slave trade per se was, I think, the first major component in anti-slavery sentiment. Emancipationist or abolition, to use the stronger term, abolitionist sentiment was, I think, in some ways, a much you know tougher proposition, possibility to accept because that that raised that raised more difficult questions, which, to be honest, we're wrestling with still in American politics today. I mean, or, you know, American not just politics, American society today. Uh, I think the, the the basic problem there, I think, is you have to imagine. I mean, something I think Jefferson wrestled with. You know, we, we give Jefferson a lot of criticism, particularly for the famous Curry 14 and notes on the state of Virginia. But I think, uh, you know, which is where Jefferson launches into this kind of what becomes this kind of crazily proto racist comparison of, you know, of, of I don't want to say overtly racist, but at least proto. I'd scratch proto from that. No, well, I, no, I, 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 I've defended Prince, so, I, so I'm, I'm willing to stick with it. But I think what Jefferson was wrestling with sincere, sincerely. In which some ways I think we're wrestling still today, is how do you imagine a biracial Republican society? I don't think that's an easy proposition in the 18th century. In fact, I think it's no, a very no. difficult. It's a very difficult one. So I think yeah. I think opposition to slave trade is compelling for lots of reasons, and also yeah. because also because slave owners understand the, the the important fact that North American slavery was the only slave system, which was already becoming self perpetuating. Obtaining more slaves from Africa would be useful. Places like South Carolina and Georgia, younger, particularly Georgia, kind of younger settlements. Um, but it was no longer really essential to maintaining the system in the same way it was in Brazil or the West Indies. Right. You know, so I, I think I, I think so. I think that that kind of position was relatively easy. Imagining emancipation broadly defined. That's you know, to be honest, it, it, it's it's a much tougher proposition because it, it because it has many more implications and social consequences. And I think you know the standard argument that historians often make is you know really the real you know the you know the best source of understanding why anti-slavery sentiment itself becomes more really first emerges in a coherent form around the midpoint of the 18th century. Most of, a lot of it's tied to the Quakers. I mean, changes that take, that are taking place among the Society of Friends. Right. Uh, where, where, you know, both in the new world and in the old world, but maybe more particularly in the new world, right. where, and particularly in Pennsylvania, where, you know, where Quaker sentiment becoming, much, in a sense, much more militant or much, much more troubled and therefore much more militant. Right, right. So uh, Will's presence here uh, suggests that we, we need to um, open this up to audience questions. So why don't we, why don't we shift gears into that right now? <laughs> 
Yeah, and thank you both. Um, I really appreciated the nuance that you brought to this uh, while still tying it to the urgencies of the current moment. And um, I thought you did a really nice job modeling the sort of um, debates when we're talking about Dickinson and Madison and so forth. So um, thank you again. Uh, we have a number of questions and I'm gonna rely upon those that have been upvoted. So if you haven't posed a question, please do peruse the questions that are there and think about helping me out a little bit, just so that I know which ones sort of have the widest appeal. And of course, if you do wanna submit a question, it's not too late. I'm gonna start us off with Keith Dougherty, uh, who writes, the most interesting thing about Dickinson's view on representation is that he proposes that the first house be apportioned according to, quote, the actual contributions of the states, end quote. Not state population, that is. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I think it goes back to what I said earlier. You know, in I think in a sense it's kind of, I don't want to say it's nutty, but it doesn't, it goes back to my point about Hamilton. I think Dickinson was probably imagining what, what it was actually what a lot of anti-federalists wanted, that the basis of financing the national government, even after the constitution was adopted, or something like the constitution would be adopted, would be that the states would that there'd be like what was called on the kind of Congress requisitions upon the states to provide X number, you know, X amount of uh, you know, funding, sometimes Y amount of materials um, that, that, would, that would support na national activities. And the, again, the whole federalist scheme, or particularly the, the Hamiltonian scheme, uh, and all, but also I think Madison had the same sentiments. Let's get rid of requisitions. You know, let's say what are the most productive forms of, of raising revenue? That, that's where, as I said previously, indirect taxes, you know, on imported goods, you know, maybe get something out of land sales. So that was land sales could be a long term prospect. You know, so I mean, to make it, you know, I mean, eventually with the, the Louisiana Purchase, that became an enormous industry. Um, so, so I think, yeah, I, I was really struck, I was really struck by that idea, which shows a kind of idiosyncratic ingenuity on Dickinson's part. But on the other hand, it didn't, it seems to be kind of, you know, a couple standard deviations off what mostly the Federalists were thinking. And so the, that sense almost a non-starter as a serious political proposal. You know, I wonder uh, if- Jay may have other positions on this. Oh, know. no, no, I, you know, actually anything to do with money is not my strong suit, but um, <laughs> I, since I have none of it myself. Um, so um, I'm wondering if that's something that is one of the many things about Dickinson that we are going to um, be able to understand more when we get more context about his life and his thought. Um, there, uh, the, I found a lot of times when something seems strange or nutty um, that, that, <laughs> that the, when I learn something about, about him, then it, it contextualizes it. And uh, so I, I'm hoping that you know, processing his papers and giving people access to as, much, as many writings of his as we can, we'll, we'll learn more. Um, and maybe it will seem more, less idiosyncratic, less nutty and more like, understandable. Mm -hmm. So we have another question here from Charlotte Crane, uh, who writes, isn't there some irony in the idea that delegates from the most tenuous state, given its relationship with Penn, are arguing to preserve the importance of, of equal vote for each state? Were they making arguments that only folks from a tenuous state would make? How much did the possibility of additional states play into these early positions? <laughs> You know, I mean, maybe you, Charlotte, uh, thank you for that. Um, maybe you hit the nail on the head, uh, you know, not really sure, but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there's something to that, um, sort of the small state complex. Um, and, uh, and yes, I mean, I know that Dickinson was very concerned about new states entering the union um, and, and what that might do to the representation of existing states. So, you know, yeah, I, I think probably that was something, something that was it, it very, at the very least in the back of his mind. Yeah. I'm like, I have to go Delaware mistake. No, <laughs> no, no. The, union, it's just, you know, the three lower counties, they don't have their own governor. On the other hand, to take the small states, Connecticut is the land of steady habits. So, you know, what, what, what could be a better qualification for being part of the American Union than having that defining characteristic? 
but De Delaware, even even during the colonial period, was it, it had a, it had a different character from Pennsylvania, and uh, no doubt and, about it. Yeah. What's that? No doubt about it. <laughs> well, so you know, I I I do not think Delaware was a mistake. <laughs> I, I'm very hey, what, what what difference here we. You know what? Uh, with my students, I'd like to say go back to the large state, big, big, the large state, small state thing. I think I mentioned this to you when we were conversing before. You take the Delmarva Peninsula, right? So you have a large state, Virginia. You have a medium-sized state, Maryland. You have a small state, Delaware. Um, if you live anywhere in the Delmarva Peninsula, do you do are any of your interests defined by the size of the state of which you're a resident, or are they not defined by the likelihood you're going to be engaged in? Chicken farming, or you know, or you know, uh, marit you know, maritime activities. You know, it's not. You know, it's just. I mean, it's this is a kind of Montesquieuian position, but you know, kind of climate and climate and environment shape your defining social characteristics. Maybe there might be a religious component. You know, but I. It seems to me what I know in the 19th century this isn't true. I think the Methodists kind of swept the whole Delmarva Peninsula. That they um, the kind of religious identity became fairly. There, there, was, there was a great zone of Methodist expansion, I think. You know, I'm not sure about that in Delaware, but I guess I would say that, oh, maybe in the in the Delmarva Peninsula, the, the, the people who live there have very similar ways of living and being and, and cultivating the land. But the problem is that, you know, the, 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 the peninsula of Virginia is connected to the rest of Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, in Delaware, yes, is very, I don't know, you know, it, it's an interesting question about the character of, of Delaware. It, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know that we have an answer, but I, and I'm not, I don't know about the Methodists. Yeah. Yeah. So pivoting from Methodist to another <laughs> religious group that has a little bit more, um, look, you know, sort of local appeal. Uh, if we're thinking about an audience that has a lot of uh, uh, Philadelphians here. Um, I've got two questions here about the Quakers. Um, so first we have Warren Williams who asks, did the Quaker preference for reaching consensus and quote, sense of the meeting, end quote, have an impact on Dickinson's thinking about the federal system? Um, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a very actually specific question. And I mean, I can say that I, I think it's likely that the meeting structure as a whole influences thinking. Um, consensus and sense of the meeting. I mean, in yes, in the sense that Dickinson was um, interested in sort of preserving the, um, the integrity of the, of the whole and not being disruptive, being what Quakers would call a, a peaceful or an orderly walker, um, mm. that, that he would uh, be a moderate and not, uh, not trying to provoke people and, you know, and, and, and you know, be a rabble rouser. I mean, I think Dickinson in his own personal, um, uh, his own personal way of being, I think it tried to exemplify that whether that crept into his um, thinking about the structures of government, I don't know, um, maybe, maybe. That, I don't know that that's a really an answerable question, but it's certainly one that I've, I've wondered about myself. Um, so it's a good one. Um, I, I wanna say it sort of came through in, in more subtle ways than, uh, than him saying like, oh, there ought to be consensus. And, you know, it's not that he was going to abolish, he wanted to abolish voting. Um, mm. So I don't know if that helps, but uh, it's a good question. Thank you. We have another one from uh, Warren Williams who asks, uh, did the Quaker preference for reaching consensus, uh, excuse me, I just read that, didn't I? I'm so yes, sorry. Yes. Um, I have lost the other question, but I've got another good one from Nancy Dickinson. An abolitionist state would be worried about the slave states externalizing the cost of slavery to them. No, the attitude of helping the formerly enslaved uh, imposed costs on, sorry, the, the attitude of helping the formerly enslaved Im imposed costs on Pennsylvania and Delaware if Dickinson's abolition, and, uh, uh, sorry, if Dickinson's abolition agenda there held that really should have been born by states in the South or South of the Mason-Dixon line, no? 
Is that? Um, I guess I I'm not quite sure what the question. Well, I think I, uh, thinking quickly about this. I mean, there there is a question that the devils, as I understand it, the devils' nineteenth century abolitionist thinking was that you know would a would a slave would the emancipation of slaves by lawful means not require compensation for the slave owners on Fifth Amendment, you know, just compensation principles. Hmm. Um, you know, to us, it's a rather strange argument and you could make some kind of, I suppose, almost Lockean counter argument that the slave's labor is itself the source of the wealth of Southern planters that's, that's been expropriated from them unfairly. But, uh, you know, I think, I think it is part, my understanding is it's part of 19th century pro and anti-slavery discussions. Uh, if you had a policy of emancipation and abolition, would the slave owners not have a just claim to compensation for the loss of what was, after all, the single most important source of capital property, or you can just say capitalism, uh, mm -hmm. either in certainly the 19th century South or arguably in 19th century America? It's kind of, it's, to us, that's kind of awful. It's a kind of strange, not to say bizarre way to think about a legal, eth legal ethos permeating or surrounding. Uh, an offensive institution, but it's part of the 19th century discussion. Well put. Um, I finally found the other question. Forgive me, Sophie. This is from uh, Sophie uh, Rizzieri, uh, who writes, could it have been a Quaker concern for preserving uh, dissent, um, a worry that small states have a right to register their opinions? Well, everyone has a right to register their opinions. You know, and there's no, I mean, there's no first, there's no formal First Amendment issue that's being posed here. But your ability to register your opinions is made possible by by representation. You know, look, can I make a quick jump here because this comes up. You know, as I said before, involved in a lot of discussions about getting rid of the Electoral College. Which, if I were the lawgiver, I'd abolish first. I do that tomorrow. Get rid of the equal vote in the Senate the day after, and whatever. Um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, we, we have, you know, it's often argued in defense of the Electoral College that it serves some important federalism function. That somehow if states did not have a role in the selection of the president, that the whole federal system would be somehow diluted or weakened. And, you know, the, and the victims here, the primary victims here would be people living in small states because after all, when you live in a small state, there aren't many of you around, as opposed to people living in California or Pennsylvania, where there happens to be there are a lot of us, uh, and so on. Uh, the problem with that argument is we have a system of representative government, which is territorially based. We're not like Israel. Israel has a system of, part of proportional representation in, in the whole Knesset, where you simply take the, you know, you take the, the final party vote and you divide seats in the Knesset, on the basis of who gets one share. I think it's a 5% minimum for a for 120 member body. In the United States, we have a strong basis of territorial representation and it operates in both houses of Congress. The presidency itself is not well equipped to represent the whole diversity, the whole complexity, the whole nuance of American public sentiment, uh, except, in, except in moments of, of great leadership. But that, that's a different kind of proposition. Um, that's why we have a Congress. And I would argue, again, I think this, again, this would be a, what I call a quasi-crypto-proto-Madisonian position, that Congress is, the, is, a, is a sufficient source of that voice. You know, I mean, Congress is a deliberate body. And all 18th century discussions, whether you're talking about the lower house or the upper house, presuppose uh, that Congress is a deliberate body. It's going to be the real forum in which local opinion and there, of course, you already have the equal vote in the Senate, which is profoundly troubling anybody who believes in one, one person, one vote principles, which is the modern norm, a lot of us think, to any democratic system of representation. So, so I, you know, it's a fair question. Uh, I think it's actually answered pretty easily. And then when you see the link to the Electoral College, you see, you know, some of its other nuances. Thank you, Jack. Um, we have a clarification from uh, Nancy Dickinson, who, um, writes, she meant that the Delaware Valley helped the former uh, or helped formerly enslaved peoples. This was a cost borne by the North that belonged on the South, not compensating the slaveholders. Does that, does that help at all? Say, 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 I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, Nancy Dickinson writes, right. I meant the way that Delaware Valley 
helped formerly enslaved peoples. This was a cost borne by the North that belonged to the South, not compensating the slaveholders. Yeah, I suppose my feeling is I wish, well, I, I, I don't fully get the whole Delaware Valley concept or I mean, how that plays in here. But, you know, I mean, Nancy's welcome to email me if, if she wants to explain it more and I'd, not, I'd be happy to give her a, you know, I mean, I'd have to think this through, and give her, yeah. you know, give her, more, you know, more thoughtful answer. And, and and that's certainly a goal of these seminars is to sort of begin a line of inquiry right. and sort of extend it beyond this hour and a half that we have together. Right. So I, I still um, don't fully, maybe I'm slow. I still, I still don't fully, I see what the question is getting. I still don't fully yeah. get it. Yeah. Well, um, I'd like to give you one more, Jack, that comes from uh, Jason Mandresh, and this will be our last question of the evening, but I will collect all of the questions we didn't get to, and I'll make sure they get over to Jane. So if uh, it's something that she feels that she can answer, um, she'll have your contact details. So uh, Jason asks, um, Jack, you mentioned that in 1775, the Connecticut delegates had written their own Confederation government. Uh, what was this called, and where might we find it? Um, you know, I have to go back to my first book and look it up, which I have. My first book is back at the beginnings of national politics, term of history, kind of, it's back in print. So you find, you know, actually try to get the women Mary Quarry to publish an article on this and they never, they, first thing they rejected. I think even that's like 50 years ago. So maybe I'll send it back to them. So there's actually, it was printed in the Connecticut Current. I'd have to look up the date. Um, there's correspondence about it. Um, through Silas Dean, who actually goes on to have a somewhat checkered history uh, in American diplomacy. Um, he, he's, he's our first commissioner to go to France uh, in, in, I think in early, late 1775, early 1776. But Dean, Dean was active in, in, in trying to get this together. And there, there's a draft set of articles. It's much shorter than the version that, you know, the committee version that John Dickinson largely wrote in, in, in June, 1776. That you know we did, that uh, that we talked about two weeks ago, but it was published. I found it was published in the Kinetic Current, you know, which is uh, you know published in Hartford. I think is is it now the Hartford Current? I think is you know, C O U R A N T. Um, so yeah, so it's out there, and uh, you know, it, it was a little bit of detective work on my part, you know, back as I say, back during the Nixon years when I was working on my dissertation. Uh, yeah, but it's there. It's it's discussed a bit in my first book, The Beginnings of National Politics. Excellent. Well, Jane, I'd like to give you the last word because I know that uh, we still have another session and I wanted to know if you might be able to frame it a little bit for us because we're going to be meeting in exactly two weeks. So I want people to have an enticement to come back same time, same place. Right. So we're going to be discussing Dickinson's um, uh, letters, uh, the Fabius letters, which he wrote to um, encourage Americans to ratify the Constitution. And the Fabius letters are really interesting because you know we talk about the Federalist Papers a lot, and, but the Federalist Papers actually were mainly focused in New York, and they weren't written to um, to a, 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 a popular audience. And Dickinson decided he was going to write these letters from uh, the pen name he assumed was Fabius, and they are written to an audience of ordinary Americans. And they also, so that's one way they differ from the Federalist Papers, but they also differ in that um, they were um, a, a very, very, um, we see religion coming through very strongly in, in, the, in the Fabius letters. And so um, it'll, it's very interesting to see just sort of like how he was thinking about the constitution and how he was presenting it to Americans. And, and, and we get a, a strong sense of his, uh, his important, the sense he had of the, the importance of religion in the American polity. And so I think that will be the opportunity we have to talk about. We'll, we'll maybe start, start out talking about religion at the Constitutional Convention and then segue into um, religion in the Fabius letters. But they're, they're really quite, quite um, engaging. And so I hope that uh, those of you who have joined us for the last two sessions will join us again for, um, for, for the Fabius letters. And with John Kaminsky, who is the co-editor of the documentary history of the ratification of the constitution. So um, a few people know more about ratification than, than um, John Kaminsky. So um, thank you for, for joining us here. And thank you, Jack, and, and thank you, Will. And um, I look forward to 
I guess you seeing me next time. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, we'll be back again together 530 Eastern time on November 18th. Exactly. Two oh, months. and one last thing. Um, don't forget to celebrate John Dickinson's birthday on November 13th. Perfect. <laughs> all right. I will let you all go. Thank you again. And um, hope to see you again on November 18th. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.